first. Okay, so uh, again, this is the third sessions in our NLP series. So this session, we will give uh, introductions to the fundamentals of the recurrent neural networks. And then I think from the next session, uh, it will be more, I think, application oriented, right? For example, machine translation, question answering, et cetera, and also other more uh, most recent, most popular models in NLP. Uh, and also we are still open uh, for speakers. So if you are interested in needing any of these sessions, let me know. You can directly comment below or, or send me a message. And still, we are, uh, the main materials will be from the Stanford uh, NLP course. So all the previous slides are taken out of their uh, slide stack. So basically, I pick pretty much, I think, uh, around 80% of their slides. And for example, for today's session, uh, the slides will be taken out from the lecture six and lecture seven. So these two lectures. Um, and also you can find the videos on YouTube. So is there uh, course recordings? Uh, I think the main difference between my kind of introduction is I, I try to make it uh, a little bit more introductory than the graduate course from Stanford. And I hope that this can serve as a starting point for you to go through their video and the course materials in depth. Um, let's get started. So uh, today we are going to uh, work through the language models and various types of recurrent neural networks. Okay, uh, so I'm going to full screen this. Okay, so first question is what is language modeling? Right, and, and I actually think of this as modeling the distributions of the words, right? Say you have a text file, and then you want to, okay, what's the probability of these words show, showing up in, in the same sentence or, like, uh, or in the same sequence, right? More specifically here, we can use the language modeling to predict what's the next word. Right, say if you are given a sequence like the students open there, so there can be lots of options, right? Like open their books exams or even their minds. <laughs> so uh, language modeling is, being, uh, is basically um, doing a, a conditional probability, right? So given all the um, earlier words, such as the students open there, and then we want to make uh, com compute the probability for the next words, right? So the next words can be any word in a vocabulary, vocabulary and each of the word will give a probability, right? So for example, the books exams can get a much higher uh, probability than a random word. Right. So a system that can do this to model this uh, distribution is called a language model. So this is a very uh, basic or fundamental problem uh, in language or, or, or in any uh, language modeling system. Uh, so you can also think of a language model as a system to assign probability to a piece of text. Right? So you can basically say you are given a sequence, you want to compute the joint probability of all the words in that sequence, and then you can just, uh, according to the chain, chain rules, and then you use the conditional uh, probabilities. Basically, you do lots of um, multiplications of these conditional um, probabilities. And then from, of, and, uh, and the vice versa from these conditional probabilities, you can, you are able to get the joint distribution of the, of the words. Yeah, so all this um, language modeling is basically modeling the probability of the, of, uh, of a sequence of words. So what is the use of language modeling? Well, I think we, we, we see this, well, we use this every day, right? When you, when you type on your phone, 
uh, sometimes uh, the system will suggest the next words, right? So like meet you at the cafe airport, so you can directly select that words and you don't need to type. And also in the Google search, you can um, type, type, if you just type the first few words, uh, it gives you a list of options for the what is the next words or next phrase uh, for your question. So, uh, and, uh, and the course uh, actually first introduced uh, NGRAM language models. Uh, it is widely used uh, in the era before deep learning. <laughs> so, so like say we, we, uh, we don't have, uh, right, like before people um, become kind of get fascinated by, by the deep learning, like what models they use earlier on. So they basically train what they call is the ngram language model. So, uh, and I think in NLP, you, you hear ngram quite often, right? So the ngram is basically just uh, a chunk of n consecutive words. Uh, the unigram is just, you know, you just break the sentence into a uh, word by itself, right? It's just a single word, like the students opened their single word. And bigram is basically you just break the sentence into uh, a uh, set of two words, right? And then the uh, and, and then there's the trigrams and foregrams and go on and on. Okay, right? so you can generate lots of phrases uh, from the text. So the idea is we can we can from this you know unigram, bigrams, foregrams, we can uh, connect the statistics about uh, how frequent they show up in a text, and then we can directly use the stats to compute the, the, the probability, right? It's basically, I think it's more like just uh, analytics and the statistical uh, calculation. Um, so uh, an example here is first, uh, they make a Markov assumption. So basically it says, okay, the next word, so the T plus one. So basically we, the, the, is the next word we want to predict. And it depends only on the preceding N minus one words. Well, it may not be true, I mean, in reality, but this is just a model assumption to simplify the model so that we can model them. Right? So basically it just said, okay, the next words uh, to predict depends only on the preceding uh, a fixed number of words. Um, and here, so th that shows the conditional probability, right? And then from this conditional probability, we can de uh, decompose, it, decompose it into like two, two kind of uh, division of uh, probability of n gram and the probability of n minus one gram. Right? So, so this, so this, uh, I think the x t plus one is the main difference. So x t plus one shows up uh, over here. Right. So, and then how can we calculate the probability? Well, we can, we can calculate the probability from their stats in the large corpus of text. We can basically just count how many times they show up in the text, right? And then like for this sequence, how many times they show up? And then without the next words, without the word we're trying to predict. Uh, so for all the preceding words, how many times they show up in a text. And then division kind of gives you approximation of the probability. I think it's a very simple idea. And, uh, and of course, I think there are many drawbacks and we will discuss that. Uh, here just shows the example, right? So, so uh, again, we need to decide how many, so what's the length of uh, the preceding words you want to use in your modeling. Here we use the four gram, so it's, uh, I think it's just use the, the, the three, three words be, uh, before the words we want to predict. So along with the going to, be, to, going to predict words, so it's like a four gram, right? So, um, and here you, we, we can count, okay, how many times students open their, you know, books, uh, books say books, right? And then we just count how many times they show up. And then we also count how many times students open their, this uh, trigram shows up. Uh, so 
but there can be many other options, right? Open their exams, open their books, like we just count everything um, that have these uh, three words. And, uh, and then by making the division, and then we calculate the probability. For example, the students open their books occurred 400 times, and, uh, and if the students open their occurred 1,000 times, and then the probability of the next words being books is 0.4, and then also the same applies to exams, right? So if it shows up 100 times, and then will be 0.1. Okay, so what you see are the problems with the n-gram models. Uh, I think the sparsity is really a big issue over here because you have to guarantee that that phrase shows up in the text, right? What if it never shows up? And then you will get what like zero probability, right? It, there's no way uh, to model that, right? Um, so, so, so sparse problem. Why? What if the words, all the words, um, you know, has a probability of zero, and then you get zeros all the time. And then if the students open there, like this, this uh, trigram never shows up in the data. And then basically, we cannot calculate the probability. Well, there's uh, some um, workaround is to maybe not using the three words, and then we can we can remove the students, and then we just use the two preceding words, which is open there, right? This is kind of you know you, you, you we basically we reduce the the the, uh, the length preceding uh, uh, of the preceding words. All right, so so we, we hope that it has a higher chance when we shorten the length. Right, so it's called a back off. So when we increase the n, basically like when we increase the 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 words, the or the number of grams, right, and then it will make sparsity problem worse. Uh, and usually, when people using this type of n gram models, they they usually don't have n bigger than five. If it's a five, it will become very sparse, and then yeah, so it doesn't have any statistic, statistical sense if it's very sparse. So, any questions so far? Okay. <laughs> So the next is, OK, how can we use a neural network language model to solve the sparsity issue? Right? You see that the sparsity is really a big issue. And then, like, uh, so here is the one example, because I think in the first lecture, we have talked about word to vec right? So word to vec is kind of, because it captures the similarities among words, so maybe we can directly use that word embedding to help with this sparsity issue. So here it shows a window-based neural model, right? So for example, over here, oh, here it just shows an example of name entity recognition. And basically, it tells the property of each word, right? So the Paris is the word of uh, location over here. But in order to correctly determine the property of words, maybe we also need to look around the words, uh, look, 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 look at the words around Paris, right? So basically we put all the embeddings of the nearby words, including Paris, and then we train a neural network, and then it gives us, uh, uh, say, a distribution over the properties, the location, people, and such. And so basically we can use the same idea over here. So we still use the fixed window, and then I think right now the length of the window can be much longer than the um, the n gram model, right? So and you can you can maybe select more than five over here. And then and then here shows a very a uh, simple uh, neural network. Right? So the input is the words, right? And then we basically concatenate all their word embeddings together. So we can use the uh, word embeddings from word to vec. And then here is just one very simple dense collected uh, hidden layer. 
And then the output, uh, basically we use the softmax to give us the dis uh, distribution uh, over the over all the, all the vocabularies uh, next uh, to predict the next words, right? So it basically gives a distribution uh, over all the vocabulary, say from starting with the uh to say to zoo, <laughs> and then it gives uh, the distribution uh, of the next words, right? So right now it shows, okay, maybe books have a high probability and also laptops have a high probability. Yeah, so this is a very simple neural network model, and yeah, and it, it solves the sparsity issue. Right? So, so the improvements over the n-gram language modeling is it, it has, doesn't have any sparsity problem, and also you don't need to store all the counts. Right? So you don't need to store all the observed uh, counts of n-gram. Uh, the remaining problem of this is the fixed window is still too small, right? Because uh, we, 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 we want, uh, because if you enlarge the lens, well, you can still, I think you can still enlarge the lens, but it's not that flexible, right? Uh, and also when you enlarge the window lens, you also increase the number of parameters, and uh, it can never be large enough, right? So the, 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 the models will become more and more complicated uh, as you increase your window lens. And also here it shows the x1 and x2. So the words are multiplied by completely different weights uh, in, in the weight matrix. Uh, basically it, it says that so there's no symmetry because uh, the, the, the assumption is that maybe from the, the, this words to the next word, the transition function shows some, some similarity. Right? We want to capture there if there's some transition function, we want to identify a general uh, function for the words to transition to the next. Right? So we, we need a neural architecture that can process any lens input, and we hopefully the language, mo the, 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 the model uh, parameters does not increase with the lens of input. Right? So this kind of motivates the recurrent neural network. Um, so like, Early on, the, the, the weights is, you see the weights, you know, it's different for every input word, right? But here, it basically, you apply the same weights over and over again um, to, to the previous words and the hidden states. So the hidden states is kind of representing all the information before this word. And then you, you observe uh, this word and in order to make, the, to, to, to make a prediction, Right, so you, you basically um, apply the same weights to, to transition to the, to the next stage. And, and it, it doesn't, so, so the, all the, and the size of the models is fixed, right? The size of the model is the fixed uh, size of W uh, here. So no matter like how long the sequence you are going to input, the, the, the model size it stays the same. And some people even ask a question of like, why should we assume that W is always the same? Well, <laughs> because that, that, that is a question that occurs to me, right? It may, it may not be true uh, for the language modeling. Well, maybe because maybe like uh, it, it can be different, but I think this is just like one type of model. Like we trying to find a universal function, a universal transition uh, function, right? To, to, to do the uh, mappings. And it turns out it works. So that's why, <laughs> that's why I think. Uh, so here is again, the same example, like students open their what, right? So here right now we have, uh, we still use the word embeddings uh, to represent the words. And here's the input and then the W is the previous state, the hidden state is basically just a vector, right? And then from the previous states, we use the transition matrix W to get our new state uh, over here. Uh, and uh, along with the new, uh, new input, uh, the word embedding together, like these two together, we apply the, the same transition um, matrix to get to the, to, the, to the new state over here. So it's, uh, 
Yeah, so it's basically it's the same weights that got applied over and over again. And then till, until here, we, we generate, we output our states. So the states, so the, uh, the hidden states here is also, you, basically you can read the hidden states at any stage. But here we read it out uh, to, the, to the end of the sequence. And we make it to represent the, the kind of the distribution over the vocabularies for the next words. Right. So, so this is a very simple RNN example. It still relies on the word embeddings. And then the hidden states, yeah, so there's uh, the weight matrix, uh, the same weight matrix for the hidden states, and also, okay, yeah, so it separates it out. So there's a separate matrix for the word embeddings. So it's a linear combination, and then it out is a sigmoid, uh, uh, out, uh, a sigmoid, uh, layer, and then it gives out uh, the hidden outputs. And then the hidden states, and then over here, it, it, it basically uh, use a soft max to map from the hidden states to the final distribution over vocabularies. So the advantages of RN is it can process any length input. Right? So the, the size of W, H, and WE is always fixed. Um, it doesn't increase with the length of input, and uh, and hopefully, or in theory, uh, it can use information from many steps back. Right, so this is a very good property of recurrent neural network. Uh, but the other disadvantages of that uh, is still the recurrent computation is slow, and. Uh, and actually in practice, uh, in practice, during the training, it's uh, sometimes difficult to access the information from many steps back because of the vanishing gradient problem, which we will see later on. So, and then next question is how can we train uh, uh, RN model, right? Say we have this structure, how can we solve for the weights? And to do that, again, it's an optimization problem. And we need to define our loss function. So the loss function will be usually is for probabilities. Uh, it defines as the cross entropy loss. Right? So basically, it's a log over the probability. XT plus one is the actual word for the next, right? So uh, you use x1 to xt as your preceding words, and xt plus 1 is the words you're trying to predict. And then y hat is a probability estimated. You basically grab the probability for the next words, for the next actual words. Right? And so you want the, this probability as close to 1 as possible. Right? So when, when, it, when, it, when it is 1, then you get a 0 loss. When it's very small, you will get a very large loss. And then we uh, basically average this uh, to get the overall loss, right? So because it's a sequence modeling, because at each step, we're always trying to pre predict the next words. So for all the scenario, we just sum up uh, their uh, loss and then make uh, calculate the average of the loss. Right, so here it basically just shows the loss over here. Uh, yeah, so from the outputs, you get the probability over the, uh, you grab the probability of the, the true label, right? And then, and then you calculate the cross entropy loss, and then you sum it up and calculate the average. Yeah, so and then once we are able to um, at, uh, define the loss function, and then we can calculate the gradients with respect to the model parameters. Uh, so it turns out uh, the gradients is basically a sum, a sum of the gradients 
uh, throughout the time, right? So through each each time, you basically calculate your loss with respect to uh, calculate gradient of loss with respect to the to the weights, and then you sum it up across, uh, you know, all from 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 most recent to 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 the time of one. So this also is called a back propagation through time. So I think it's a very simple derivation to to uh, to get this. Uh, basically, you just sum up uh, all the gradients at uh, all the time steps, and then you can also see like why it's kind of slow <laughs> in training. I right? basically you need to uh, sum up across all the time time steps. Uh, so any questions? I want to pause a little bit for questions. Well, everyone is familiar with the recurrent neural network and just can't wait to, for the next. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. okay, so we can continue. Uh, so let's see some examples of uh, generating, always generating the next word from the language model, right? So for example here, uh, you basically always use uh, you choose, for example, the words with the highest probability, and then it will serve as the input to the next words. And then you, you, you predict the next words, and the, again, it serves as the input for the next word. So you basically just doing this over and over again, and then that will gives you a, a sampled sentence. And then <laughs> I think this example is funny <laughs> because because you, you can train this model and any kind of text, and uh, and then it, it it tends to generate text in that style, right? Say if you <laughs> if you train this on all the Obama speeches, and then you will you will you will this just some some random generates uh, of Obama speech, right? So for example, the new challenges, uh, and I will not able to get this done, so I don't know. Maybe it's uh, I don't know why it will generate that, but but it's kind of uh, uh, like funny to see the model learns this pattern from the speech data. And also, if you train this on the Harry Potter's words, and then you will you will you will you will be able to generate some sentences in that style. Right, so for example, Harry kind of always panicking. <laughs> so it's like, it seems like Harry always shouting and panicking and, uh, and that. So yeah, so I mean, it, it, it's still readable and most of the time the grammar looks, looks okay. But I mean, the, the, the main, uh, or the content or the, or the high level meaning kind of lost, right? Maybe you can still, uh, understand some meanings from some sentences and words, but like overally, what what it what it is trying to say is is lost. And also, we can train this on the recipes, and then it becomes totally does not make sense <laughs> because you you have all the gradients. Uh, and then, but, but, but your procedure to how to deal with the gradients seem not very related to the gradients you input over here because it hasn't learned the structures between say the gradients and also how to deal with these gradients, right? So that uh, relationship is lost through this uh, language modeling. Yeah, 
So, so here just some, some examples, but it's still fun to try some of that out yourself. And, and, and th this is actually just a very simple recurrent neural network, right? So, and it already can do some of this. So, looks uh, a good starting point uh, for language modeling. And then, uh, in order to improve the model, we need to have uh, objective um, metric. So people usually use a metric called perplexity. Uh, so basically, it's the inverse of the probability. So this is the the probability of the next verse, and it is the inverse of the of the probability, and then it is the it is normalized by uh, over one divided by t. So t is kind of the number of words, right? And then you multiply all these probabilities all together. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so this, I think this is quite important because without this, you will get always smaller and smaller <laughs> perplexity when you have uh, more and more words. Right? So this term is to do the normalization. And also, uh, we can relate the perplexity to the our cross entropy loss that is used in the neural network network basically you put uh, so this so this is the kind of this is the same equivalent and you put if you put the uh, exp log uh, inserted here and then you can derive this so basically it's the expan exponential of the cross entropy loss yeah and then we want the perplexity to be lower, so the lower the better. And here it shows the perplexity of different gram, um, language modeling. So this is the five gram models, so it's pretty high. Uh, and here, I don't know what is this, a blackout sampling. Anyway, so it's pretty bad. Uh, and then as we like uh, increase increase the the complexity of a recurrent neural network, for example, if we use the uh, LSTM, which we are going to introduce next, and also we are stacking the LSTM together, you will get a lower and a lower perplexity. Uh, Actually, this is my favorite slides in that course. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's amazing, right? Just to give you a picture of uh, recurrent neural network networks in the language modeling. So what we have introduced is a very simple RN, or it can be called a vanilla RN. Uh, and then we are going to introduce about GRU. Uh, um, a kind of uh, more complicated um, RN, right? And LSTM, and then you can think of this with a different taste, like strawberry and chocolates. And we can stack them together. So it will be like multi-layer, <laughs> uh, multi-layer vanilla, multi-layer strawberry, multi-layer uh, chocolates. And in the end, uh, we are going to use a network uh, with a phrase like this. So it's going to be stacked, multi-layer. It's going to be bi-directional and with residual connections and self-attention. So you, it, it is, looks like all the different kinds of ice cream, all the different tastes and all messed up like, together in one bowl. Right? So that is, <laughs> that is uh, well, maybe uh, where it is developing into right now. All right, so we right now we are we are we are still understanding each different taste, and then maybe by the end of the series, we 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 understand, you know, what this taste, uh, or where this taste can be applied, and and uh, what future taste is going to be, uh, going to develop into. Yeah, this is my uh, favorite slice, uh, in in the, in this lecture, and. I want to move on to the LSTM if you don't have any question.
Okay. Okay, so then let's move on to the uh, the next lecture, uh, so lecture seven of the Stanford course. So it here solves more practical problems of recurrent neural network. So as we said, a simple uh, recurrent neural network cannot learn long-term dependency. And it is because of the vanishing gradient problem. And then that motivates the developments of two types of RN uh, called LSTM and GRU, gated recurrent unit. And also, uh, it also gives you uh, some introduction over the um, exploding gradient. Uh, and, or, and actually, this can work for any type of uh, neural network, right? So gradient clipping is to solve the exploding gradient problem. And skip connection is to solve the vanishing gradient. And these uh, tricks can be used for any type of uh, neural network not just RN. And then we are also going to see what is bidirectional RN and also multilayer RN. So all of this is uh, very fundamental for the recurrent, uh, for the recurrent neural network. And uh, yeah, so I strongly recommend to understand all these different concepts so that for the following up or for the following sessions you will feel more comfortable okay so what is the vanishing gradient uh, so here it shows the intuition so here is a loss uh, at time t equals four right so it's after uh, four times uh, and say this is the the hidden states and then we want to see uh, what's the impact of the loss over these hidden states. And if we calculate the gradient of the loss over the hidden state, it basically just shows, okay, uh, given the loss, how the hidden states will change, right? So basically we calculate the gradient again, so that will tell you the, how much it will change. And according to the chain rule, it will become a sequence of uh, multiplication. Right, so it will be a, become a sequence of uh, uh, multiplication of the derivatives. The, well, the problem with this is if any, if any of this derivative is small, it will give you a very small number and it will, it will, it will uh, become smaller and smaller. Right, so, and also if you have a very long uh, sequence, it will basically have a much, much higher chance to get a small gradient after so many steps of multiplication. So the vanishing gradient problem is when this, when these derivatives or well, any of these are small, the gradient signal will get smaller and smaller when it, when it uh, back propagates further. And then it basically means, okay, after, uh, for the long-term relationship, it, it, won't, it, it will be lost. The signals, when, when the, the gradient, when they reach here, it will be lost. And, but uh, the, the, the states, the, the hidden states update, well, well, uh, well like uh, depend on the nearby loss, not the uh, far away loss. Right, so the gradient signal here will get, will, will become much stronger uh, for the for the loss nearby from the gradient signal nearby, rather than like the gradient signal like uh, three or much farther away. So the models will tend to update with respect to near effects, not long term effects. Then, then what's the problem with that? Right, so in the language modeling, the long-term effects is actually very important. But here it just shows some, like one uh, toy example. Uh, for example, the, the writer of the books, so we want to uh, predict whether it's the E's or R next. And 
And we know that, okay, so basically it's, uh, the writer is the key kind of the factor to decide what is the, uh, whether this is the is or are, right? So for the syntactic uh, uh, recency, uh, so we should, we should the, the model should depend on the writer and then to, to choose between is or are. But for the sequential recency, so the books will become more important than writer if you uh, consider just the sequential recency, right? And then it will, it, will, it, will, it will tend to predict R over here. So it won't be correct. So validation gradient problems will bias the, the, the simple RN models towards learning from this sequential recency. Okay, that is a validation gradient. And then next, uh, it all, uh, any questions over here? Okay, and the next is the uh, exploding gradient. So exploding gradient basically is the gradient is very large. So it's the other way, uh, the other way, right? So if the gradient becomes too big, then the update steps uh, become too big, and then maybe you would observe a loss increase rather than decrease, because it can, it can take a, a back updates. What if that large gradient is not correct? And then you would take a large step and make a big mistake. And also it, it could result in the infinite or not or NIN in your training, and then you have to restart your training from an earlier checkpoint. Right. So basically it's when this gradient becomes too big and it, it's called an exploding gradient. And one solution for that is called a gradient clipping. Basically it's doing the normalization uh, over the gradient. Right? So basically we set a threshold of the norms of the gradient magnitude. So the, the taking the norm basically just tells you the, the magnitude of the gradient, right? So if the magnitude is too big, and then we will, we will, we, we are going to uh, normalize it, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, so basically we, we, we want to control the step, uh, like how big the step is in, in that direction. Uh, especially this, this is going to solve the gradients calculation along the cliff, uh, cliff. Because the gradient can vary a lot uh, at a cliff, right? Because over here, the, the direction may be over here, but like, uh, or at this smaller inter, uh, kind of smaller surface, it could lead up, uh, right? And over here, uh, I mean, ideally, we hope that you will uh, point a gradient over here, but it could, the calculation could uh, calculate it based on this surface, and then the gradients could lead to uh, this direction. Right. So, so it's not that controllable. <laughs> I would say it depends on where, that, where you are right now on the, on the surface. Uh, so basically, and with clipping, we can we can kind of make sure that they are always uh, within the uh, you know small small steps, right? So we are still staying around this uh, neighborhood, so that one mistake uh, won't kind of mess up the loss, right? So it won't mess up your current position. Yeah, so, yeah, so, and then let's move back to the validation gradient. So basically gradients become too small uh, for the long-term um, dependency. So how can, uh, how can the RN to learn to preserve the information over many time steps? And also in the simple RN, the, the hidden state is uh, constantly be rewritten, right? It's constantly rewritten by the, uh, 
by the you know most recent input. Right? Can we just can we is there a way to preserve the earlier information on? Right? So so that motivates the development or invention of the LSTM. So how about we have a separate uh, uh, memory? Uh, basically, just just uh, stores stores this uh, long term uh, memory. So the LSTM, actually, uh, it is proposed more than 20 years ago. <laughs> so yes, uh, in the beginning, it's a little bit absurd to me that, OK, how the most popular uh, model is like proposed like, like 20 years ago. Uh, and at that time, maybe all the LSTM, LSTM is too, uh, takes too long to train. So, so it doesn't have that big impact as it is, it is now. Right? So, yeah, but it's pretty amazing <laughs> to see that the mo one of the most fundamental models is developed uh, in 1997. And uh, yeah, so basically here it, it, it still has a hidden state, but it also has a new uh, cell state. And the cell state stores the long-term information. And then each LSTM cell can erase, write, or read information from the cell. Right? So they, they can choose whether or not to use this uh, long-term information. Uh, and then the control of these actions is controlled by the gates. So the gates, uh, basically, is 0, 1. And then in neural network, the sigmoid function is a perfect function for gates, right? So it map everything from uh, to zero to between to between zero and one, right? So and then we use the sigmoid function to model the gates, so it can be uh, one or zero, and also can be in between. And the gates are dynamic, right? So the whether or not they are open depends on the current context. So here is just the idea behind LSTM. Uh, I, so <laughs> it looks like a lot, but I think it's pretty easy to, uh, to, to figure that out if you, if you read like this. Right? First, all the sigmoid uh, function is the gates. Right. Whenever you see sigmoid function, it's like, uh, you, you just think about, okay, it controls whether or not that information is going to pass or not. And that information is based on the previous hidden states and current observations. And so this is basically uh, like, uh, so this is one layer of neural network. And then the input are the previous hidden states and then the current input. Right. So basically we have three gates. And the, the next is we want to update our new cell content. So the new cell content, uh, just like the simple recurrent neural network, right? So the, the simple recurrent neural network, the, the cell says, well, solely depends on the previous states, uh, previous hidden states, and also the input x, right? And then you use a tangent function to scale these values to between zero or the two between negative one and one. Basically, it just controls the values range. And then the, 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 the gates are then used to, to decide how much I want previous cell states to pass and how much I want to write in the new, 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 new cell states. Right? So these new cell states, you, you can think of as some more regency uh more recent information and then c t plus one kind of represents a long term relation right so the forgot gate so the, the, the this is a forgot gate so if it if it becomes one and then it basically just pass on all the uh previous um uh, information long term information and then if this is zero it basically ignores current input right so this is it calls the uh, input gate. So it controls how much recent information is going to return into the new cell state. Right, so all, all of these gates is going to serve as, okay, how much uh, long-term information is going to be kept 
and how much the new information is going to overwrite the cell state. Right, and from here, and then from the cell state, so it, it has another uh, output gate to control how much the the how much information is going to to be read out of the cell states to serve as the, your output. Right. So and people, yeah. So this is just like from the equation point of view, what it looks like. I think what this is a very popular block from Cola, right? So it uh, it draws these gates very clearly. Uh, when I when I see these plots, so always first to identify the sigmoid and the mul multiply, because the sigmoid gives you one and zero, and the multiply control the path, right? Basically, it it gives you a way to identify the gates. So here, uh, it, this is the forget gates. Right. Going to the next. So this is the forget gate. So this is the cell state from early on. This is the, to decide, okay, how much the early on cell state is going to pass. And then this plus is to some uh, new content. Right? And then we, we are looking for the sigmoid and the multiply. And then this is another gate. So this is the input gate. Right, so basically it tells like how much the the hidden state and current input is going to pass. And then the the, the, the tangent layer is basically just to give you give it some nonlinear um calculation transformation. Right? And then uh so this is the forgot gate, input gate, and it gives you a new cell state. And when it reaches here, is so this is a point wise. So this is not a neural layer. So the neural layer is in yellow, and then the pink, <clears throat> pink is a point wise operation. So the dimension stays the same. Uh, the pink basically just just uh, uh, just map each of the value to between negative one and one. So it's a point wise operation on the vectors. So it's just a, a, a operator function. And then it basically map all the values of the vector to, to between negative one and one. And then here is, is another uh, output gate to decide how much the cell states is going to be read out to the output. Right, I think once you are able to circle out the gates by identifying the sigmoid and the multiply, I think it's very easy to understand the LSTM structure. Is there any questions or is it clear to you? Okay, let's move on. So why does it can solve the validation gradient problem? I mean, to some extent, not guaranteed <laughs> uh, to fully solve that. So basically it makes it easier for the RN to preserve inf information over many time steps, right? Because if you set this gate to be one and this, this gate to be zero, it basically just pass on pass on and on the, the cell, the, the earlier cell state information. All right, so uh, this is the advantage of that, but the LSDM does not guarantee there's, there, uh, there's no such problem forever, right? Because again, the, the neural network is not, a, it's not a global optimization. You cannot find a global optimization, right? So this is, uh, more like a st stochastic gradient descent, so you, you cannot guarantee uh, that the gate is perfect, right? So you can always get one and get zero, get zero right? So most of the time you are just for somewhere in between or closer to, uh, to, to one or closer to zero, right? So it's not a perfect, it's not a uh, global uh, optimal, uh, you cannot find a global optimal solution. 
and and for that it it it, it does help solve the validation problem to some extent. Yeah, I see. Uh, but then in uh, the one drawback, of, well, maybe not drawback, um, but maybe for some other scenario when there's not enough data, right? So, and then people trying, uh, are trying to find ways to simplify the RSTM, right? As you remember, the RSTM has three gates, right? Forgot and input. And then, then the people realize, okay, how about we merge the forget gate and input gates into uh, update gate? So, so for example, over here, right? So you have update gates. So one minus this is your forget gate, and then this is the input gate. So basically, the sum of your forget gate and input gates is one, right? So I think it makes sense. Uh, so you basically reduce one gate, uh, but but still there's no output gate because in GRU there's no difference between cell states and output and hidden states. I always think the hidden states as output because it's usually people use the hidden states as the output. So there's no big di there's no difference, but it adds a new 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 gate called a uh, reset gate. Uh, basically, it, it tells you uh, what parts of the previous hidden states are used to compute the new content, right? So it either resets some of the earlier uh, hidden states, and then and then the other part I think is is uh, is the same with the RSTM, right? So basically, it simplifies RSTM by reducing one gate. And then uh, makes the cell state and output and the hidden states the same. Uh, and once you are doing that, basically you have much fewer. Actually, not a, that a lot fewer. Maybe uh, you have around 70 70 percent of the parameters of the LSTM, uh, and that is still some like uh, model complexity reduction, right? So. Yeah, so like the LSTM make it easier to uh, retain the long-term information if we set the, the update gate to be zero, so it will always pass on the previous state, uh, previous cell state. Well, since there's no cell state here, it's always put the previous hidden state. Yeah, so uh, actually there are, there are many uh, gated uh, RN variants, but these two are the most widely used. So you can you can see that you can basically use the logics to de define your own uh, cell structure. Right? So it depends on how many gates you want to use, how you want to control the information flow, and as such. Right, and I, I I'm think of this like a circuit design, right? So yeah, it's a it's like there's a logic a logic gate, and then like how you are going to make the well connection, and as such, I think it's like designing a designing a RN cell is like designing a circuit. Uh, and then the rule of sum is usually the LSTM is the good default choice. Especially if you have a long dependencies, and if you have lots of training data, uh, you, the RSTM is always uh, the first choice to begin with. And maybe for the speed, and also if you have uh, much less data, uh, then you want you may want to switch switch to GRU. But RSTM is always recommended as the first choice. Okay, and any questions on the difference between RSTM and GRU? Okay, and then the next uh, is about, so the validation or exploding, 
Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, so the next uh, question is about the vanishing or exploding gradient. So it's uh, actually a, 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 a problem for all the neural network. Right? So it's not just the RM problem. And especially the deep ones, if you have uh, multiple layers, then uh, like very deep layers, then you will, you will have, uh, due to the chain rule, right? So you can have uh, small, very small gradients after many uh, multiplication steps. Right? So lots of uh, deep uh, architectures um, actually suffer from these problems. And then they, they use, uh, you know, direct connections, right? Just like the forget gates in the RN, they, they skip several layers and then you, uh, and basically it makes the direct connections to pass on the information. So that uh, leads to the invention of the REST net, so the residual uh, network. Right, so basically you just skip, skip multiple layers and make the direct connections. And here is the identity matrix. So yeah, basically, just it pass on the directions. Right. So this is a building block in the residual learning. So, so you you can see that for different types or different um, neural network architectures, there's always something behind to motivate them. Right? It's not like they just born. <laughs> uh, but but they, they, there is a reason behind that, right? So they, 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 they are designed this way to solve one specific problem, like the validation gradient. Okay, so then let's move on to uh, bidirectional RNs. Right? So all the early on is all just one directional uh, recurrent neural network. But for some uh, language modeling, such as uh, sentiment classification or machine translation, I think uh, you can wait uh, for, the, for the words after your current words uh, to, to make decisions, right? So you, 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 can, you are able to get the whole sequence uh, of, the, of the sentence, and then you, you, can, you can take advantage of uh, of the words preceding, and also you can take advantage of the words afterwards. Right? For example, the sentiment classification, uh, the movie was terribly exciting, but if you just use, uh, you know, up to here, here, and then the model observer terribly, well, it, it may be, maybe it means terrible, and then you may give a negative uh, a label prediction. Right, but if you are, you know, considering the words after that, like it's terribly exciting, and then okay, it's a positive. Right, so not only we should con uh, consider the preceding words, but also we should consider the the words uh, right right to that one. Right, so this gives you a more full context information. So this is what a bidirectional RN looks like, right? So we have a forward RN. So this is the forward RN. So here is the input. Here's the hidden states, input hidden states as such. And then we train a backward RN, right? So it's another a simple RN. And then the input hidden states, and then basically the hidden states is uh, you know, uh, is is transitioned, you know, backwards, like from exciting to terribly to what, right? So this is uh, this uh, direction. And then the bidirectional RN basically concatenate uh, the hidden states together. <laughs> so actually it's a very simple idea. It's basically, okay, uh, train two separate RNs and then you, you, you concatenate uh, their uh, hidden states together. Right. So basically, the, the, the context here, say the terribly includes the information before terribly and also includes the information, uh, the context after terribly. Right. So that can help make, uh, uh, make the context complete and will help with the model prediction. 
so this is uh, what it looks like in the uh, kind of like in the formula way, right? So there's a forward RN, there's a backward RN. Yeah, you can replace the RN with the LSTM or GRU or any type. And um, most of the time, these two RNs have separate weights. So we train two uh, totally different RNs, unless you really find a reason that this uh, backward and forward should also share the same weights. Right. And then the, the, the hidden states now become the con con concatenated hidden states from the forward and backward. And then we are, we are going to pass on the concatenated hidden states to the next, to the next parts of the network. And to make it simplify, when you see uh, this bidirectional, basically there's like two, two RNs, right? So it just went forward, went backward. But right now, like just for simplicity, uh, the diagram just show this bidirectional. And right now the states are kind of the concatenated, like two states, right? And merge them into one. So usually we use bidirectional RN when we have access to the entire input sequence. Uh, in language modeling, like we always, or the text generation, right? so we, we have to always generate the next word. So maybe you cannot use the bidirectional RNs, but for the sentiment analysis, for machine translation as such, you, you, uh, we, we, we can, we should allow the bidirectional RNs. Right? So we just translate the entire sentence and then, and then we should consider the sentence uh, bidirectionally. So bidirectional is usually uh, very po more powerful than one directional. And for example, the most popular BERT model, the B stands for bidirectional. And we are going to introduce this model in the uh, in future. Okay, that is bidirectional. I think it's a uh, uh, you know, kind of integrates the information in both directions. And then there's a the multi-layer RN. It should come very naturally, right? Because we develop multi-layer uh, neural network like a multi-layer convolutional neural network. And we believe the multi-layer really can learn uh, different, you know, uh, information, integrates the information at different levels. Uh, so R is already deep in one dimension, right, over time steps. Uh, but also we can make them deep vertically, like make it, making them into multi-layer RN. And also it allows the network to compute more complex representations. Right? So multi-layer RN is also called a stacked RN. So this is the diagram for the multi-layer or stacked uh, RNs. So here's uh, basically is passing on the hidden states. That say the first layer, the input is the words. And then the second layer, the input will be the hidden states from the last layers. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I see a question. So <laughs> we cannot use bidirectional for predicting the future. Yeah, I think so. Like if you are, if your task is to predict next word, uh, yeah, I don't think, unless you want to make your preceding uh, words to be bidirectional, but I don't think, yeah, that, that is a good fit for that. Uh, yeah, so all, always, uh, again, they are on the layer th three, so the input will become the hidden states of the layer two. Right, so yeah, so basically it learns the hidden states. Well, the hidden states is kind of learn multiple levels of representations.
and high performing RNs are often multilayer, uh, but usually they are not as stable as the convolutional or feed forward networks. Uh, for example, for the, yeah, so that a paper in 2017, I guess there's a lot of changes since then. Uh, it, it, the, 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 the author concludes that the neural, uh, for the neural machine translation, two to four layers is the best uh, for the encoder and four layers is best. So people usually just uh, choose to use two to four layers of RNs in practice. And also if you have much deeper RNs, it's going to, you know, have more severe <laughs> Uh, validation gradient problems, and then you, you have to use the skip connections as such to train, um, for example, A layers of RNs. And transformer based, yeah, so there's other types of networks developed like BERT uh, to use the much deeper R, uh, RNs, like 12 to 24 layers. Yeah, but when they when they grow this deep, they use the skipping net connections to solve the validation gradient problem. Yeah, so I think that's the main uh, uh, content for the RNs. So basically, uh, we have worked through again the RSTM, and I hope that right now when you see this diagram, it's very Simple, right? So you just <laughs> identify the sigmoid and multipliers, and then this is the transformation, and this is the gate, right? So it's very obvious what he's doing uh, in each LSTM cell. And also, we have compared it with the GRU. So GRU basically simpl simplified by merging the forgetting cell and the input cell, right? So it, it has one uh, gate, sorry. So basically, it had one gate uh, less. Of, uh, than the LSTM. And also it, it has uh, the cell states and the hidden states are exactly the same in GRU. And, but in practice, the LSTM is always the first choice unless you really find the performance is too slow and you want to um, speed up your training and then, then you may want to try GRU. And then we have talked about the validation gradient and the exploding gradient. And then for the validation uh, gradient, well, the RSTM uh, is kind of the structure, right, to uh, use some forget gate to directly pass on the information or like, uh, or like seeing other types of networks or nearly in all different kinds of networks, they use skipping connections. Uh, to like in the residual network to skip several layers of connections to directly pass on the information to solve the validation gradient problem. And for the exploding uh, gradient, you, we can choose to keep the gradients, right? By, by uh, uh, normalizing it, by, divide, by dividing by its uh, magnitude. Right. And then we, we, we learn about the bidirectional RN, right? So whenever possible, uh, bidirectional RNs has a better performance than just one directional RN. And also we, we have the option to stack the RN together. So usually we stack them into two to four layers of RNs. And more than that, we may need to skip uh, some connections to avoid the validation gradient problem. Uh, I think the activation function shown here is all 10. But ReLU, uh, maybe, I, uh, yes, I think it's it, uh, 10 because the tangent function is kind of uh, mapping it between kind of negative one and one. And some people may say the tangent is a little bit, you know, uh, slower to compute the that loop, but yeah, people can use a different activation function uh, with different, with RN.
yeah so that's uh, it and uh, I have earlier on so I think a while ago when I'm trying to figure out the difference between uh, LSTM and uh, GRU so I write this a uh, block just um, you know, you know, you can you can tell how the dimensionality change uh, through each step. Right. So, if you are interested, uh, feel free to look at this block uh, over here. And also here it show uh, here is on YouTube. Uh, you can you can get you know all the videos to this course. So I, I think I have covered 80% uh, of the content in these two lectures. But if you want to go depth, uh, and I do recommend you to watch the whole videos just to, especially the second second video. Um, you, 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 you will see more like uh, procedure proof, like in formulas of the validation gradients.